Welcome! It's so great to have the Mitch Lecture back on campus. I don't want to destroy that. Uh, my name is Andy Runquist. I serve as the interim provost here at Hamlin University, and I want to welcome all of you. We are so excited for this afternoon's presentation. Um, this is the 23rd annual um, 3M Ronald A. Mitch Lecture in Chemistry, uh, which is meaningful to me because that's how long I've been here. So there's basically been one of those every year I've been here. Um, and so it's, it's, for me, it's an institution. I'm so happy that we're back on campus to do it. We're, of course, proud of so many noteworthy lectures on campus, and this is just one of them, and, and we have one for, in a variety of disciplines. Our Hamlin University mission statement, our values, and our vision are put into practice every day. Those core principles drive us to create a diverse and collaborative community of learners. We are dedicated to the development of students' knowledge, uh, values and skills leading to successful lives of leadership, scholarship, and service. And this is just such a, a great example of what can motivate our students to do that. This lecture, of course, exemplifies these, extensi these essential Hamlin University values, and are, we're really, really excited to have Dr. James Tour here today. You'll hear more about him uh, introduced by Professor Schlatter here in a minute. A little bit about these lectures. Ron Mitch uh, is a graduate of Hamlin University in 1956. Afterwards, he joined 3M as a research chemist four years later, and he has 19 patents for his work there. When he retired in 1998, the 3M Foundation established an endowed fund to recognize and appreciate Ron Mitch's outstanding leadership and the service that he provided to the 3M company. Ron and his wife Marilyn matched that fund, and together at Hamlin University, they created the 3M Ronald A. Mitch Endowed Fund in Chemistry. Their combined generosity supports this lecture, along with several scholarships and collaborative research grants. We heard a little bit about the people involved in that just now at lunch. So on behalf of Hamlin University, I want to extend our thanks to Ron and Marilyn Mitch for their generosity. It gives our students opportunities to do exceptional scholarly work at Hamlin and to prepare for careers of service and leadership. Ron and Marilyn are unable to be here today, but they are absolutely thinking about us and they're excited about today. So, I want to now introduce Dr. Nick Schlatter, who is the chair of the chemistry department, who will come up and introduce our speaker today. Nick joined Hamlin about the same time I did, so he's also been here a very long time. We're so appreciative of his leadership and his teaching. So he got his BA in chemistry at Carleton College. He has an MS in physics. That's incredible. At Stanford. And a PhD in chemistry at Stanford. He did a postdoc at the IBM Research Facility in San Jose, and he was also for a while a member of the technical staff at Bell Labs. He is a faculty member in the chemistry department, currently the department chair. He's also a national counselor for the local section of the American Chemical Society. He's a board member of the Minnesota Academy of Sciences, and his research interests in surface films of polymers and molecular monolayers using vibrational spectroscopy and preparing nanostructured surfaces for novel liquid interactions. General interest in nanomaterials, and he has general interest in, their, in nanomaterials and their applications. Recently, he's been interested in 3D printing for chemical education and laboratory exper experiments. Please join me in welcoming Professor Nick Schlatter to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Andy, and welcome, everyone. Um, so it's my great pleasure to be here today and be able to introduce the Mitch Speaker coming back to the first in-person lecture since 2019. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about Ron Mitch and 3M as well. Uh, this is what makes this lecture possible. And it's of particular interest or importance, I should say, to the chemistry department since it funds scholarships, summer research, a little bit of equipment, support for faculty. Um, it is really something that makes it possible for the chemistry department to continue its commitment to providing a research experience for as many of the undergraduates as possible in chemistry. Um, we believe this is really crucial to they're going forward in their careers, whether it's in chemistry or professional schools or any other activity. Um, certainly it's required for graduate school and it significantly helps our students get internships, lab jobs, technical management positions. So thank you, Ron and 3M. 
talking a little bit about today's speaker, Professor James M. Tour. He got his undergraduate degree at Syracuse University, his PhD from Purdue, and took postdocs at both the University of Wisconsin and Stanford. He eventually joined the Center for Nanoscale Science and Technology at Rice University in 1999. It is notable that Rice is also the site where Richard Smalley, who was one of the discoverers, discoverers of fullerenes, uh, think Buckyball, if you've heard of that, or C60, in 1985, and, all, and Smalley also shared the resulting 1996 Nobel Prize for this work. Smalley's work helped build Rice's outstanding nanoscience and technology facilities, and Professor Tour continues this great work. What is this nanoscience or nanotechnology vision? Well, in 1959, Richard Feynman gave a talk. It's called, There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. And this was a talk that was very early, maybe even before anybody else had thought of this. But he pointed out that we could literally use existing technology to work at the nano scale. And he even put a challenge out to build a nano motor. Um, inspired a lot of people, we didn't have the tools. Moving forward in 1986, a fellow named K. Eric Dres Drexler wrote a book, Engines of Creation. And by 1986, we had a lot more tools, and he laid out Feynman's vision in detail. These are all things that we could do. But one concept that was in there was called nanobots, which are little nano machines, um, which conceivably could even repair the human body. And things began to happen. Um, for instance, in 2005, Professor Tour's group synthesized a nano car. It's a single molecular structure with buckyball wheels. Uh, and you could watch it move on an atomically flat surface with scanning tunneling microscopy. Um, so uh, it had no engine or brain yet, but that was part of what is to come. Uh, the first nano car race was held in 2017. <laughs> And by 2022, the second one was held. And now we can start talking about having motors and maybe control systems. We're not there yet, but we're getting closer. There's some things that do cause motion. Um, a lot of technology yet to go. So let's back up for a moment to Professor Tour and his accomplishments. In addition to developing nanotechnology, Professor Tour, Tour has founded 12 companies, published over 750 research publications, won many awards, including a National Science Foundation Presidential Young Investigator Award in Polymer Chemistry, the Office of Naval Research Young Investigator Award in Polymer Chemistry, the OSPER Award is the American Chemical Society Award for Significant Achievements, um, the Arthur C. Cope Award, also the American Chemical Society for Achievements in Organic Chemistry. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry, a member of the National Academy of Inventors, and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. The list goes on. Um, what I haven't made clear yet is that Professor Tour's interests also extend into many other areas of nanotechnology. His research group is active in applying nanotechnology to medical problems, for example. Um, but remember how the nanocar will need a brain? You have to be able to write electronic circuits. His group has developed ways to write graphene conductors and transistors, which may become the brain for something like this in the future. Today, Professor Tour will talk about something a little different also an aspect of nanotechnology that will be crucial to our futures. And that's related to graphene, which is a one molecule thick layer of carbon. 
he's found a way to quickly and economically produce it. Um, why is this important and why will it revolutionize things going forward? Graphene at the larger scale is amazingly strong. It is something that you could imagine in composites that would make them super strong. Uh, it's also flexible. You can imagine making flexible electronic circuits in the future. Um, so we could look at various codes. In fact, you, you may have some graphene in your pocket in your cell phone already. It's already invading a lot of products. Making it cheap will make a huge impact on our world. So this is what Professor Tour will tell us about today. And with that, I would like to welcome Professor Tour to take the podium and explain the wonderful new world. Thank you for having me here, and uh, uh, thank you for allowing me to participate in, in uh, these functions around the Mitch Symposium. I've met many interesting people during my time here uh, over the last day and a half. Uh, what I'm going to tell you about is, is the work going on in our group, and uh, this is just sort of a collage to tell you about the areas that I'm not going to tell you about today. <laughs> um, this is an area called uh, laser-induced graphene, where we learned that you could take any laser that's found in any machine shop, you probably have four or five of them on this campus already, it's a 10.6 micron laser, it's used for inscribing and cutting in a machine shop. You hit polyimid surface, it will turn it into graphene. You can do it with any carbon surface. This is not putting graphene onto a piece of bread. This is converting the carbohydrate strands of the bread into graphene. This conductive material, which uh, uh, you can draw circuits, we've built 5G antennas out of it, uh, lots of sensors have been built out of this. This is where we took a coconut and turned it into a supercapacitor. Um, uh, this area has really expanded. There were over 500 papers last year on using laser-induced graphene, so it's a technique uh, that's really taken off in the industry. This is, and, and this will spawn probably five companies. Already one is, 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 is active, but many more will come out of it. This is where we've learned how to unzip carbon nanotubes chemically and make graphene nanoribbons, and I'll show you in a moment what we're doing with those. This is a computer memory built out of silicon oxide, which is usually a, just an insulator, and it's a two-terminal memory. This is now in a public company called Webit, that we started that's now gone public, and, uh, uh, and, and so, so this, this is a, a new type of computer memory. We work in this area of traumatic brain injury and stroke, uh, where we could take a, a brain that would normally look like this after a traumatic brain injury and have it look like this. A traumatic brain injury is something that's, that's important to everybody. It's the number one disabler of older adults. It's also the number one disabler of younger adults. Younger adults because of fall of all your skateboards and scooters, and, and so it's a, it's a big problem for, 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 uh, for all of us. This is uh, graphene carbon nanotubes, carbon nanotubes coming out of graphene. When we built these electrodes, they had very high surface area, about 2,400 meters squared per gram surface area. We knew it would be a great electrode. We started a battery company. That battery company is called Zeta Energy. That's in Houston. They are now building the prototype battery systems in, uh, in Houston. This is called graphene quantum dots. When we started this work, graphene quantum dots were $1 million per kilogram. So you have a kilogram of material, it's $1 million. A kilogram is about like this much material, $1 million. We learned how to make this from coal. Coal is about $100 per ton. So think about those economics. One step, 25% yield, going from $100 a ton to a million dollars per kilogram. So, so uh, uh, this, this is now in a public company we started, it's gone public, it's called DOTS. It's used in anti-counterfeiting. Uh, it's high-end women's purses and shoes made in Milan. Might get shipped to one of your high-end shops here in, in Minneapolis. And somewhere along the way, those purses have been swapped out with purses that have been made in Vietnam 
and nobody can really tell the difference. So how do you know? Well, you, you put little markers in there that are anti-counterfeiting markers, so you put a UV light up to it, and you see a certain pattern that would be very hard to mimic. That's what these are going into. Uh, we have another project where we're converting plastic waste into material that traps carbon dioxide. This is in a company called H2 Blue now, uh, where we take one problem, plastic waste, and use it to solve another problem. This area is an area that I'm going to talk to you today about. And this area is something that I spoke about with the folks in the organic chemistry class this morning. Uh, I guess you didn't know this, Nick. We've built motorized nanocars since 2006. All right, so we've had these a while. And uh, uh, these motors turn and they push the car along. These motors spin unidirectionally, and they spin at 3 million rotations per second. So they can push these cars along. And now we are using just the motor part with an appended, an, an appended uh, uh, peptide to target specific cells. These will go down on the cell surface, and then they drill a hole in the cell, and they kill it. We're killing cancer cells and super bacteria this way. And these other topics we'll talk about in just a minute. Here's the 12 companies we started, 1 through 12. Number 13 is a number of different companies that we are in the midst of starting. There's one more. I haven't added it in here. But, but these two have already started. They're already underway. And uh, so we go from these quantum dots, this computer memory, battery, neural cords, which I'll show you in a moment, where we're using graphene nanoribbons to heal up spinal cords. Nanorobotics is these, using these nanomachines to drill into cells and medicine. Zariant is a is a, a treatment for pancreatic cancer. Uh, uh, LIGC, uh, uh, Forbon, is, that's the first company that was stored, started to exploit the, the laser-induced graphene. H2 Blue I told you about. Geronox is for that Down syndrome, traumatic brain injury, stroke, and dementia. Rust Patrol is an is a, a anti-rust coating that I developed in myself. Usually my students develop everything. Here I went in the lab myself. I thought it couldn't be hard, too hard to build an anti-rust coating. So developed that, started a company around that, and uh, um, so that's commercial and on the market. Roswell Biotechnologies, that's DNA sequencing and uh, on, on molecular chip uh, work. And this universal matter, which I'll tell you about, and these other companies we'll talk about today. Here's a rat, and this rat has actually had its spinal cord completely cut in two at C5, at the base of the neck. We put one drop of a 1% solution of graphene nanoribbons in that gap and sew it back together. And after two weeks, the rat gets up and starts walking with a totally severed spinal cord, totally in two. Gets up and starts walking after two weeks. And so it scored an 18 out of 21 on the mobility scale. 21 is optimal mobility. And then you'll see, you'll see her after three weeks uh, the transformation that happens by three weeks. And she looks really quite normal after three weeks. So there she is after three weeks. And uh, um, uh, scored a 19 out of 21 at this stage. And, and you'll even see that she tries to run away. Uh, I guess after what she's been through, it's to be expected. But uh, there she goes. She tries to get away. And, and uh, that's what it could look like. So that's in a company called Neurocorts. OK, so let me tell you about this flash graphene. This is a, a, a procedure that was developed by this young man here, Dewey Long, when he was a graduate student. He's an applied physics student working in our lab. And what he found is that you can put carbon between two electrodes. You apply a high voltage and a high current. And that carbon turns into graphene. You put enough energy into it that every carbon-carbon bond breaks and reconstructs as a thermodynamically most stable system, which is graphene. Not diamond, but graphene. Graphene are single atomic sheets of graphite. And, and uh, uh, they run, the current price is $60,000 to $200,000 per ton. And uh, there's a big bright flash, which is black body radiation, that occurs. And that's why we call it flash graphene. It heats to over 3,000 Kelvin, which is about 3,100 Kelvin, which is about 2,900 degrees centigrade, uh, in about 3 milliseconds. So very rapid. And then it cools right back down. It's just a very short pulse. Uh, these are some of the features that we're going to talk about today. But let me summarize them. We heat quickly, 10 to the 5th Kelvin per second. It cools at 10 to the 4th Kelvin per second. Uh, it's only heated for milliseconds. There's amazing tunability. We can run it in seal system, open system, open to the air. Uh, same with the laser-induced graphene, open to the air. 
uh, because, because there's enough outgassing that it's self-protected. We've made lots of different materials here, lots of different 2D materials. Boron carbon nitride, boron nitride. We've made nanotubes from this. It's metastable. We can trap materials in these metastable states, which are kinetically trapped. Uh, they're not thermodynamic, but they're kinetic. We can make materials that way. Almost any carbon solid, we can dope the graphene. We can have, have other additives to it. You say we must be putting a lot of energy into it. We are not. We are only putting $30 of electricity per ton of material. $30 per ton. So we can take, for example, metallurgical coke, which costs about $200 per ton. We put in $30 worth of electricity, no water, no solvents, and we get out a material that sells for $60,000 to $200,000 per ton. Uh, uh, we're using this, we can treat PFAS this way, which are these forever chemicals, turn it into fluorinated graphene. Uh, we, we've optimized this with machine learning. We can take post-consumer mixed waste plastic and convert it into graphene because plastic is a carbon compound. Uh, no water, no solids. We started this company, Universal Matter, and these other companies around it. This is very clean graphene. This is a spectrum of, of the cleanest graphene that's ever been seen. This is a, the 2D peak. This is the, the G peak. You see no D peak here. Here's the characteristic spectrum with a very small D peak. This is going from carbon black, anthracite, coal, calcined coke. Uh, this is from coffee. Coffee is only 40% carbon. Coffee is C6H12O6, it's a carbohydrate, it's only 40% carbon, we were getting 35 of the 40%. This is when we first started. Uh, it's come a long way from there. What this makes is something called turbostratic graphene, which means that the layers are not well ordered. If you try to exfoliate individual sheets of graphene from graphite, you can do that, but it's a lot of energy has to be put in. Because the, the different sheets are slipped, by half a unit so that you have the electron rich part over the electron deficient of the next one which makes these stick together very strongly. Here this has no time to order well. Graphite comes from a geological time frame. This is forming in milliseconds so it has no time to order. Because of this it's much easier to pull these layers apart and unshear them, uh, 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 I'm sorry, shear them apart when you're making it into composites. Uh, this was from our initial paper, which we published in January of 2020. We were making up to one gram batches at the time. Uh, they were, they, we could disperse them in water with a surfactant. Uh, this was commercial graphene, dispersed in water. You, you, you set a fugit and then decant. It looks clear. Our stays homogeneous in solution. Uh, we could blend it into plastics. It does better at strengthening the plastics than does carbon black. Carbon black is added to lots of plastics. If you didn't have carbon black in some of these chairs, they would just collapse when you sit on them. Your rubber tires will be somewhere about 40% by weight carbon black to really stiffen that, that rubber. Um, and so this does better than carbon black in, in rubber materials, plastic materials. If we add 0.1 weight percent, we will increase by 35% the compressive strength in cement. 0.1 weight percent increases by 20% the tensile strength of cement. Cement and concrete are 8% eight, eight of all CO2 emissions of human beings is in the making of concrete and cement. Because you take metal oxides, you heat them up to 2100 degrees centigrade, you blow out CO2 in the process, converting them to metal, metal uh, you take metal carbonates, convert them to metal oxides. And then you take that and you add a lot of water to it, so you've heated your furnace to 2100 degrees, which costs a lot of CO2. Then you add a lot of water to it, you put it on a very heavy truck, and you transport it. 8% of all CO2 emissions that, that people make is from CO2. So if you can reduce the amount of cement by 30%, that is a huge advance in CO2 reduction. Here's the, the genesis. Of, of this flash dual heating technique. It was a one capacitor sitting between two electrodes and Dewey Long was just flashing this and he saw some peaks for graphene. It wasn't that clean at the time, but he optimized it so that we went to this, this flash dual heating station zero, then we upgraded it. You know, here's two bolts going through a, a, a glass tube with samples in it and just taping it together to, to clamp it down. These were early versions and you know, we were using our laser to cut little wood blocks and, and, and little pieces here. 
Then it got into bigger versions. This, this has 48 capacitors in it. Each one of these capacitors is a, is a uh, capacitor that would start a truck. And we charge these up, then we flash it. And here's what the computer screen looks like. So you write this software, so you don't have to touch anything. You're just touching a computer screen, and you can charge it up and flash with it. So we built these bigger systems. This is 0.6 farad in, in energy it can deliver. Um, we build our own spectrometers. How do we record these temperatures over 3,000 Kelvin? Once you're over 2,500 Kelvin, you can't use an IR thermometer anymore, so we just do it spectroscopically. And so we build these, uh, these little spectrometers in a little Tupperware box uh, for about $1,500, but <clears throat> rather than spending $70,000 on a spectrometer, and, uh, and then we can record the temperature. We build our, our fast and charger systems. We, <clears throat> we get the, these, uh, um, uh, uh, these load resistor systems. Uh, we buy these on eBay. We built a lot of this during the COVID shutdown. Uh, we had no supply chain problem. We were buying off of eBay. eBay, there's no supply chain problem because this is materials that people have stored in their garage and they sell it for pennies on the dollar out of their garage. So the material's already all there. And so we buy everything off of eBay and Amazon for parts, and we put these together during COVID. These are these fast charging units. If we just ran on the, on the, uh, the electricity coming into our lab, it would take two minutes to charge the capacitors. But with these fast charging systems that we could build, we could run it, we just charge in 20 seconds, which increased our production rate 10x. Um, you can run this AC or DC. The reason we don't run it AC is we would dim the lights in the building. So we just slowly charge up some capacitors over 20 seconds and then hit it. Uh, we, we built a lot of systems with this. Uh, we were cleaning a lot of brass parts as we were flashing. Uh, we were weighing out a lot of metallurgical coke. This is a bullet loader. Uh, if you paid for this by laboratory methods, it would be like $20,000 for this balance. They could dispense powder in a set amount. But if you just buy a bullet loader, it's $300, and it's the same thing. It's a balance and a, and a, and a charge dispenser. This is a bullet cleaner, a bullet shell cleaner. Uh, this was a great way for cleaning off our brass parts that we have. It just goes in with a, a, a cornmeal mix, a, a corn husk mix, mix and, and uh, 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 shakes it around, and you get this. So this is $60 from Amazon. Rather than buying a, a very expensive parts cleaner from a laboratory apparatus company. And uh, this is a system we built also during the COVID shutdown. I have another picture of it here. Uh, we, had, we got a DOE grant in October of 2019, which is just before COVID hit. We had two years to convert. They had, we had to demonstrate in one day converting one kilogram. We had to make one kilogram of graphene from a US coal product in a day, in a 24-hour period, make one kilogram of graphene. We built this. I bought some 3D printers when our lab shut down. I bought some 3D printers and sent them home with the students. And uh, uh, they built this in their homes, the, 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 this automated system for dropping in the graphene-contained systems. It would flash it, drop back out. And you see that it would drop out into a, a paint pan. This was our receptor. Uh, receiver where we would drop the graphene into it so it would come in through this feeder hopper and all of this is just 3D printed. All of these little little wheels and pulleys and everything are all from Amazon and eBay and uh, uh, built the whole system for somewhere around $5,000 in parts. Uh, built the whole system and, uh, uh, and then we delivered. We were able to do not one kilogram in a day but 10 kilograms in a day and delivered to the Department of Energy six months early, even with the COVID shutdown. So, so uh, uh, just just buy equipment and send it home with your students. <laughs> and then work at home. Uh, we've done a lot of uh, machine learning to use AI to optimize the system because depending on what your starting material is coming in, it discerns right away what the starting material is and what parameters have to change to optimize for that material. So very quickly, you can optimize what sheet size of graphene do you want. If you run for 500 milliseconds, you're going to have a much larger sheet size than if you run for, for 100 milliseconds because it's growing over this, this time period. Uh, here's the advantages of graphene. Graphene is non-toxic. It's even used in several medical applications. It's naturally occurring in the environment. In fact, we wanted to check this. So years ago, 
I bought a bottle of whiskey on, on, uh, on, on the department budget. And, and because it was an experiment. Because whiskey comes out of a charred barrel. It comes out of a charred barrel. And I knew there must be graphene that people are drinking. And sure enough, you put it in the TEM, transmission electron microscope, you see sheets of graphene. People have been drinking graphene. It shears off of graphite in riverbeds. It's naturally occurring in our environment. It's a terminal natural sink for carbon. Any asset you bring up from under the ground is going to end up as CO2 at some point. It goes into landfills, and this decomposes and turns into CO2. If you just have carbon, you just throw it out. Plants will take that thing up. Plants die, boom, they go into CO2. Any asset you bring up under the ground turns into carbon dioxide, except when you turn it into graphene. This is a natural terminal sink. The reason we have graphite in the world and graphite mines is because microbes don't eat that. And uh, so it's a great way to turn, turn your carbon into. Uh, it can be put in composites of all types. We'll see some of that. The, there's no water, no solvents. We put in 30 to $35 per metric ton uh, uh, of electricity per metric ton of coal converting to, to uh, uh, graphene. And at this, this is the current price, 60 to 100K per ton. So we started this company, we started this in, in, uh, in the winter of 2019, in, in like uh, February or March of 2019. The CEO is John Van Leeuwen, and, and Dewey Long, who invented this, went to be the, the chief scientific officer. And it's about 50 employees now. It's oversubscribed. Uh, there are entire nation states that want to invest in this company. And uh, uh, it's gotten over $40 million in grants between the US and Canada. That's beautiful money. For those of you who are investors, uh, that, there, there's, you don't give up stock for that. That's free money. You're not giving up uh, uh, assets for that. that, is, that is, those are grants to the company. And so, so that, that company's doing quite well. It's already put out of business the largest graphene company in the US and the largest graphene company in the UK. And uh, because our price for making graphene is so much different than what the other price was. It's going now into concrete. It's going into, uh, so remember, uh, 0.1 weight percent, use one third less concrete. Uh, one percent will triple the life of an asphalt road. Think of the energy savings on something like that. Uh, going in paints, paints, wood composites, uh, metals, plastics, bone composites, goes into lubricants, uh, uh, sheet uh, plastics, and, and uh, corrosion inhibitors. All of these that company Universal Matter is now uh, uh, partnering with, signing joint ventures. The CEO did not want to be in a commodity chemical business where you have to sell large amounts at very small margins. And so, so uh, what he did is he hasn't sold any graphene yet. He won't start selling them until the fall. And they'll be at over a ton per day production by then. Uh, uh, because you sign joint ventures, joint ventures. So we own part of the concrete business, part of the asphalt business. So you own the downstream business. Because just remember this, any, with any product, the closer you are to the final customer, the more money you're going to make. The people who make the most money on the iPhone are Apple and AT&T. Whoever is selling to the final customer is making the most money. The chip makers make much less than the person who's finally selling to the final company. That's where you want to be, as close to the final customer as possible. How is this an energy effort? Well, uh, where is energy going to come from in 20 years? Well, if we look at energy today, what we do is you take natural gas, you burn it, you combust it, and you make CO2 and water. That blows out about 800 kilojoules per mole. What you can do is you can take methane, you can strip the carbons off it, and make carbon solid. You can take that hydrogen, take the hydrogen, and can mix it with oxygen and get water in a fuel cell generating electricity. This is a fuel cell. The, these two steps combined blow out of about 400 kilojoules per mole. So it's only half the energy. Well, is that good? Well, what happens is that if you look at the, thermo at this, the thermodynamics are the numbers that I gave you. Now if you look at the real numbers, which are what you get out of, a, out of in practical sense, is 25 to 40% efficiency on combustion. Your car around town is about 25% efficient. 
because it's a big heat engine. It's blowing out a lot of other things, blowing out a lot of heat in the process. Whereas this first process is 90% efficient, the second process is 80% efficient. So when you compare these two, it's about the same amount of energy out in practical terms. Thermodynamics is what you could possibly get in the best of all worlds. This is what you practically get. You get the same amount of energy out. So all oil companies are moving toward this. We have something at Rice University called the Carbon Hub. ExxonMobil is part of it. Uh, Shell is part of it. Uh, Saudi Ramco is part of it. Because this is where they're all going, moving away from combustion. And so you have no blow, blowing out of CO2 into the air. If humans blow out 30 billion tons of CO2 every year through combustion, that means you'd be blowing out 8 billion tons of carbon because you just strip off the oxygens and you have uh, 8, billion ton 8 billion tons left. That would be carbon. If you were just to throw that out in the environment, let's say a fertilizer like, like biochar, your plants would take it up, the plants die, it's going to form CO2. So what would we do? We want to turn that into graphene. What would you do with 8 billion tons of graphene? Well, you could put 8 billion tons of graphene today into cement and concrete. Cement and concrete, now the updated numbers are over 50 billion tons of, of uh, cement and concrete are made today, every year. You could certainly put in graphene at that, so you, you have a place to put it if you have to. But it's going into many other products. It's just that cement and concrete swamp all other building materials combined. How's this an environmental effort? Well, there's a lot of waste food, not just in the United States, everywhere in the world. 30 to 40 percent of all food is thrown out because it has to be. It goes bad. And so, so it's thrown out. And that forms not just CO2 when it's thrown out. It forms also methane, which is a much more deleterious greenhouse gas. Big waste food problem. Big plastics problem all over the world, particularly in Asia. Asia. There is an island. There's an island larger than the state of Texas in the Pacific that is 10 feet thick. It's a floating island of waste plastic, come mostly from Asia. And we know that because you can, you can take a piece of the plastic and you can identify where it came from. They throw it into rivers, it ends up in the, in the Pacific Ocean, and accumulates there in the Pacific, Pacific Ocean. It's got fishnets, all sorts of things. Rubber tires are not that much of a problem in the US. We've learned how to deal with that by paying is when you buy the tire. But around the world, it's a big problem. All of these can be flashed and turned into graphene. Uh, this is all the different. Uh, Consumer plastics now turned into graphene. This is the spectrum of graphene, every one of these. The reason why recycled plastic costs as much as virgin plastic is because of human separations. Human beings separate the different plastics. You have to get the pure streams to recycle them. All of these mixed together give the same spectrum. It doesn't matter. All mixed together, no problem. You flash it, they all turn into graphene. You don't have to wash it. There's no detergent washing of the plastic or anything. We've done it with foods. We've done it with human hair. I mean, this is going to be the best way of turning carbon into graphene. Uh, here from waste plastic, it's $35 per ton of plastic. There's no sorting, no pre-washing. It's unaffected by plasticizers or dyes or inorganic fillers. There's no solvents are needed, no subsequent purification of the graphene because things like aluminum, silicon, they all sublime out. You're heating this thing up to 3,100 Kelvin. Uh, carbon doesn't sublime until 3,800 Kelvin. Aluminum and silicon are down at 2,800, so they're all long gone. But this is it's self purifying, and you have no low value ash left over. What about a linear versus a circular economy? Normally, we take raw materials, we make a product, we use the product, and we throw it out. How can you circularize this? So, here's an experiment that we did with Ford Motor Company because all car manufacturers now in Europe get the car back after the life of the vehicle. So 40-year-old old jalopy given back to Ford in Europe. It's your car. What do you want me to do with it? I don't know. It's your problem. You can only landfill 5%. So what does Ford do with it? Well, they can melt down the metals, but the problem was what do you do with 200 to 350 kilograms of plastic? A lot of these are engineering plastics. You can't melt them down. They're thermosets. They're not thermoplastic. They're all mixed together. You've got foam cushion seats. All the, every wire is stripped. We got 10 pounds of that mixed plastic. We flashed it. We turned it into graphene. I sent it to Ford Detroit. They put it in their new composites. And so they put it in their new composites because Ford, every Ford has had graphene in it since February of 2020. It's in the foam cushion seats. It's in the underhood insulation. 
and more is going into it because it lightweights the vehicle. It did, they put it in the foam cushion seats, it did the sound absorbing, it increased the Young's modulus and the compressive force needed on the seats. It did everything it was supposed to do by putting the recycled, in a sense, graphene from their old composites, turn it into graphene, put it in the composites. It said, send me that, those composites you made. They sent me the composites that they made. Guess what we did with it? We flashed it and turned it into graphene. So this is what you can do. You can just take it, flash it again, turn it into graphene, put it in your new materials. It's, it's great for a circular economy. We've, we've uh, uh, used it in lubricants, in composites of all types, in concrete. And uh, you say, can we make nanotubes? We can. You just take the plastic. You, oh, you just need a cabinet. So you put a little bit of iron chloride in there. 0.1% uh, uh, by weight iron chloride in with that plastic. And when you flash it, boom, it all turns into nanotubes. Because now you've given a, a growth catalyst for this to grow on. So you get graphene uh, and you get nanotubes out of that. Uh, we've learned how to dope this or substitute it. You add heteroatoms and you flash it, and those heteroatoms end up in the graphene. So we've made boron, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, phosphorus, sulfur, and mixtures of those. For fluorine, it's sitting above and below the plane. For things like boron and nitrogen, it's in the plane. Uh, we have taken Teflon and PFAS, PFAS, forever chemicals, and flashed them. And here's what happens. When you have the, 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 the fluorine in there for capping, what happens, this is over one second. So this is, this is an evolution. The evolution period is not millions of years or billions of years, it is one second. If we stop after about one millisecond, we get an amorphous carbon out of it. If we stop it after about five milliseconds, you get fluorinated nanodiamonds. If we stop it after about 100 milliseconds, you get fluorinated flash graphene. If we go to about 500 milliseconds, which is half a second, you get fluorinated concentric uh, uh, concentric shells, these, these uh, uh, concentric systems of graphene. So, so uh, um, you can change what you get out just by stopping the electronics. So you have an evolution period, but your evolution period is just one second. Where are you going to stop this? Uh, here's hydrogen from waste. This is one of the first places I'm, I'm out talking about this. So there, this is really important. There's only three elements in the periodic table that can be fuel for human beings. Only three elements. One is carbon, which is primarily what we use now, and we're seeing some problems with that, filling our atmosphere with CO2. Another one is hydrogen, going to hydrogen fuel. And the third one is plutonium. Those are the only three. The sun is not fuel. It is energy. Fuel you put in a bottle. Energy comes from the sun, uh, energy comes from wind, energy comes from the flow of water. Fuel you can put in a bottle. Uh, hydrogen is a great source of fuel, and there are different ways of getting hydrogen. Right now, hydrogen is made this way. You take methane, and you mix it with steam, and a nickel catalyst is called steam methane reforming, and you get hydrogen out plus CO2. The problem is you make 11 to 12 kilograms of CO2 for every kilogram of hydrogen. So when you run on a fuel cell with hydrogen, that hydrogen has already come at the cost of a lot of CO2 being produced. That's the problem with hydrogen today. It's made by steam methane reforming. Well, you can capture that CO2 and try to pump it down hole. That's called blue hydrogen. But you spend a lot compressing that CO2 and finding a place to pump it down hole. If you take renewable energies, and you, you use that renewable energy to electrolyze water, so you turn water into hydrogen and oxygen, you can do that. What is the cost of doing that? We'll see the cost of doing it. It turns out to be quite expensive. But you're, only, you're making less than four kilos of CO2 per kilo of hydrogen, so it's considered, considered a clean source of hydrogen that way, but it's expensive. Black hydrogen is, comes from get coal gasific, gasification. Pink is using nuclear energy to electrolyze water. Uh, turquoise hydrogen is the process that I showed you before, where you take methane, you strip the hydrogens off, then you use those hydrogens in a fuel cell. It's called turquoise hydrogen. And yellow hydrogen is using solar alone for the electrolysis. White hydrogen is hydrogen that's found in formations underground when you're fracking. 
It's called white hydrogen. Well, the Department of Energy had what's called an Earthshot program. You've heard of this term, moonshot. Now they have Earthshot programs. What can we do for our own planet? They started this Earthshot program in 2021. They said, we want one kilogram of hydrogen for one dollar in one decade. All right, it's called the 111 program. We're not part of this program, but I think we've already solved this because we're producing hydrogen for negative dollars. Negative dollars. We get paid to make hydrogen. And how can that be? Well, if you look at hydrogen, here's the, the growth of hydrogen from 1975 to 2020. Things haven't really changed, but it's about to go up because right now most hydrogen is used for making ammonia, which is our fertilizer. And it's because of ammonia that we can eat. If you look at the, the curve for human population, when the Haber-Bosch process came in, where you make ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen, you see this huge uptick in human population when we learn how to fertilize. So it's used for fertilizer, and it's used to hydrogenate fuel oils. You hydrogenate the fuel oils, you get rid of the double bonds, you get rid of the aromatics, you put in more thermal content. But it's going to go up dramatically because we're going to start using it in fuel cell vehicles where our only effluent now is water vapor. We're not generating any CO2 in the process. Most, 20 years ago, most of our, our, our uh, hydrogen came from oil. Now most of our hydrogen comes from steam methane reforming, from natural gas. But it's still making 11 to 12 kilograms of hydrogen for every, every uh, uh, kilogram, uh, 11 or 12 kilograms of CO2 for every kilogram of hydrogen. So what we do is we take waste plastic. Did you know waste plastic is a big problem in the world? <laughs> big problem. We take waste plastic like polyethylene. We put it between two electrodes and flash it. We do a slow flash over a period of four seconds. Because if you do it fast, you get a lot of unzipping of the polymer. When it hits the ceiling temperature, TC it's called, and unzips back to monomer. This is why polymers are really dangerous in a house fire, for example. Because they, they'll hit a certain temperature in that house and the polymers start depolymerizing and blowing, blowing organic vapor into the air and the house explodes. That's why there's explosion of houses and, and fires sometimes. But anyway, you, you do a slow flash over about four seconds and we generate hydrogen. Well, how much hydrogen do we generate? Well, what we can do is if we look at polyethylene, here's the hydrogen that we generate. The, 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 um, the, so here's the hydrogen yield, here's the hydrogen efficiency. What you can see here, these big bars from polyethylene, it's mostly H2. We do get some methane coming off, some ethane, some protein, well, propane to butane, but it's mostly hydrogen. Why does H2 form as opposed to CH bonds in methane? Well, the H2 bond, the HH bond, is, is about 14 kilojoules per mole stronger than the carbon-hydrogen bond. It's purely thermodynamics. It, 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 it gain, gains more energy to make a hydrogen-hydrogen bond than a carbon-hydrogen bond. And so we get mostly hydrogen out of this. Uh, and so what we do is we do what's called an LCA, a, a life cycle assessment. Uh, every one of our papers, we have to have a life cycle assessment now. It's how good really is this? Well, if you look at the cumulative energy demand, here's our flash fuel heating process from polyethylene. It's, it's about the same amount of energy that you would use for green hydrogen. If you look at how much CO2 you generate in the process, it's not that much more than just this green hydrogen from electrolyzing water. It's a lot better than the gray hydrogen we're, we're doing now with greenhouse gas emissions. But here's the bottom line. It all gets back to money. If you do green hydrogen electrolysis of water using only renewable sources, wind, solar, it's almost $5 per kilogram of hydrogen. Remember, DOE wants $1 per kilogram. Green hydrogen is $5 per kilogram. Cannot work. Gray hydrogen, which is what is made today, is about $1.50 per kilogram. This is what you're going to have to compete with. You can only be a little bit over this if you've got a, a greener technology. But you've got to be able to compete with this. We are at minus $4.50 per kilogram when we sell our graphene. You sell the graphene, that is what you make your money off of, you are then making hydrogen for negative dollars. And you say, well, that's because you're selling the graphene for $60,000 a ton. No. I took that number of $60,000 a ton and divided it by 20. 
brought it down to $3,000 a ton, projecting it to where it would be if it were a bulk plastic, around $3,000 per ton. At $3,000 per ton of graphene, we'd still be making $4.50. We would be making $4.50 to, to make hydrogen. This is a way to take carbon materials in waste plastic, in waste. It's not just waste plastic, it's household waste. We've got a whole program off of household waste. The vast majority of what you and I throw out is carbon. If it's not glass and it's not metal, it's carbon. And, and all, this has a lot of hydrogen with it. You get the hydrogen off as H2, you take the carbon, you turn it into graphene, you put that into your building materials, never enter the CO2 cycle again. It is a great show for humanity. Uh, this is where this is going. So um, we're flashing many things. So this is a mountain. These are big, big hills of fly ash. Fly ash is the residue that's left over after burning coal. You burn coal and you get this residue that's left over. It's the inorganics that are left after burning coal. And it's mostly uh, silicon oxide, aluminum oxide, calcium oxide, some iron oxide. And there's a lot of rare earth elements in that. Rare earth elements are these precious elements, but they're not, they're not formally precious elements, they're these valuable elements at the bottom of the periodic table. We need those, badly we need those. And uh, uh, they're in every one of your smartphones, every one of your computers. And China now controls the market. The U.S. used to have a big market in this, but we shut down our mines 15 or 20 years ago because a lot of radioactive materials were coming up with it, and the separations were too much trouble. In China, they have no problem. They just pump the, the radioactive material back down hole. We're not allowed to do that. When the U.S. got out of the business, the Chinese raised the price tenfold on rare earth elements. So now it's become a national security concern. Turns out coal has rare earth elements in it but it's very dilute. Now you burn away the coal, you're left with the rare earth elements and these other metals. But now it's encased in a silicon alumina, uh, aluminosilicate glass. So it's very hard to get at this. We flash it, it breaks the glass because of that fast heating, fast cooling, <clears throat> and then we just wash it out with 0.1 molar HCl to get the rare earth elements. That's coming in Nucle number one. Nucle number two is we take printed circuit boards. Printed circuit boards are a toxic waste. Every time you save something to the cloud, it's not in a cloud. It's going onto a printed circuit board somewhere in a server farm. Those printed circuit boards are replaced every three years. Lots of precious metals there, lots of toxic metals. We flash it, we get out all the precious metals come out, all the toxic metals. What we have left after flashing, it goes from a toxic waste to something that's clean enough to be agricultural soil in the state of California. That's how clean it gets. Uh, we, are, we are flashing, we already published on flashing the battery anodes to revive them and now battery cathodes, that paper's been submitted. That'd be another company, and then flashing soil, soil remediation. We can get out all the heavy metals, we get out all the, the, the uh, organics carbonized, and, and we get out the PFAS as well. So this is, this is the process that's going through. With that, let me just say that this work was funded predominantly now by the US Army Corps of Engineers, and the Air Force, and the Department of Energy, and here's the folks that do the work, and uh, uh, with that, I'll end it and take questions. Thank you. Yeah, I told you to change the world. <laughs> question. A non scientific question. How do you protect your Okay, so I have filed one disclosure per month for the last 25 years, okay? One disclosure a month. So think of how many, how many uh, uh, office actions I'm working on at the same time. I have, I have one that I was working on on the airplane, just coming over here, and I'll be working on the airplane going back. I file a lot of patents. A lot of times these disclosures will be combined as we fly, file several provisionals and bunch them together. Um, so we have patent protection. It's up to the companies to protect it. Once they license it, they are obliged to now have to go, go out and protect it. And uh, uh, when in other countries, we will file in other countries. We file in China, but in China, things are opaque. We don't even bother filing in India because they, they don't protect things anyway. We don't bother filing in Russia because if you go to Russia to defend it, you'll die before you get to the courthouse. Uh, so there's just some locales you just don't even bother with. And, and, uh, but most of the market is, is going to be uh, 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 the U.S., the EU, we of course file in, and, and 
a couple of countries in Asia. We file in China. Uh, we've gotten some patents to go through in China. Uh, usually you have to have a corporate partner in China, and then all of a sudden the patent gets accepted. So there, there are mechanisms. Yeah. Okay, so, so the, the size of the sample and uniform heating. So that's a lot of what the company has worked out. We've only flashed up to about 10 grams at a time in my own lab. And uh, 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 you have to put in, the larger the sample, the higher the voltage, the higher the current. So you're not doing a flash of one ton at a time. You do a flash of a certain number of, say, kilos at a time. But it's, I want you to, to I can't talk about what the company does. Let me talk about what I have in my own mind. Okay, it's like, it's like the block of a car. You have lots of, 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 of uh, piston chambers. Piston pumps, squeezes in the material, the piston is one of the electrodes, boom, flash, and push it back out. So you do lots of smaller flashes, and lots of them going, boom, 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 and dumping out kilos at a time. So you, you keep the flash to a manageable level according to the amount of electricity that you can bring in, uh, you don't. You can run it DC. You can run it AC. If you bring in enough power, you don't have to run it DC. And uh, uh, the 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 other thing about the the efficiency of the flashing, it's actually the middle of the sample is the hottest because it's the furthest away from the electrodes, which are the massive faces of the cooling. So actually, the the middle of the sample is the hottest. We use quartz tubes that we flash in with with, with uh, uh, graphite electrodes. Um, but in, in the company, they have, you, you know, they're running on a totally different scale, totally different materials. And so, so um, but that, that's how you do it. But always with dual heating, if, if you just take a wire and, and put, put a high voltage across it, that wire's gonna break. Where does it break? It always breaks right in the middle. It breaks furthest away from the electrode. So, so getting heat to the middle is not generally a problem. I'm just curious because oxygen, you're not running in an oxygen-free atmosphere, yeah. I guess. Can you comment on just why it doesn't get Why doesn't it just burn up? It's the Today. same thing that happens with the laser-induced graphene where we use the laser in the air. There's enough outgassing that it's self-protected. So, for example, if we start with metallurgical coke, which is a coal product that's been heated, or a calcine uh, of petroleum coke, which is another petroleum product which comes out the the bottom of these, these things where there's no more distillation and they take it and then they heat that in air. Uh, uh, it's already been cooked. So you get a lot of the volatiles off, but there's, there's still only about 90% carbon. So if we start with, if you start with a kilo of metallurgical coke, we can end up with 900 grams, 90% yield of graphene. The other 10% has come out. Because, because that will be hydrogen atoms, that will be oxygen atoms, and a little bit of, of other gases. So, so what happens is those gases come out, and they're moving out, and that's called outgassing, so it's protecting the material inside from getting burned up. It's a very convenient way. You mentioned um, seeing graphene in materials or things we already consume, but those are such trace amounts. Are any of your groups or affiliates doing research into what higher consumptions of graphene would look like in the human body or like health or safety concerns? Yeah, so, so you know, I'm an organic chemist, and I probably am more sensitive about putting chemicals into my body than anybody else because I'm an organic chemist. And I know that our bodies are extremely well-balanced ecosystems, and anything you do any, any medication you take, for example, to solve something is reacting somewhere else as well. And that's not to say that I'm against medications. I mean, you've got to take medications or you die, okay? So you, you know, everything is a, is a balance here. But what I'm saying is I don't take them willy-nilly. And, and, uh, and I, I don't even drink alcohol. You know, I bought that bottle of whiskey, but I don't even drink alcohol. And I, and I didn't even want to go in and buy it. I sent a student to buy it because they're really used to buy it. They know where to go. And, and, uh, um, but, but um, uh, so I'm careful about it. So you, you're not putting graphene in uh, indiscriminately. But if it's in a bone composite, 
it's fine. Many people have used it, use graphene oxide as drug delivery vehicles. We use, in this company, uh, uh, Geronox, we're using a, a small oxidized pieces of, of graphene that, that, that come from, from uh, uh, coconut husk. Uh, we're using that, and they seem to be non-toxic. Seem to be non-toxic, they clear in about two hours. So we have about a two hour half-life. And we had to increase in the bloodstream. We had to put on peg, peg groups to increase it to two hours. The graphene oxide just came out very, very quickly. I'm talking within, within 10 minutes, you're down to like 50% of it. So as long as the particles are small, they go through the kidneys and out the urine if they're below about 70 nanometers. If they're above 70 nanometers, our bodies have mechanisms to get rid of it too. It goes into the liver, through the bile duct, into the, the intestines, and out the feces. Thinking about your example with the PFAS and the evolutionary track, one of the stages was diamonds. Or yes. Yes. Yeah, no, no. About three M abrasives. Yes. Is one of your company to make abrasives that have different properties than natural diamonds. Yes. So so. Um, Yes, so you have nano, nano diamonds are great for abrasives. I kept pushing my students to get larger and larger. I wanted to bring a diamond home to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, they could only get up to about 100 nanometers, which is still too small to see. And, and, uh, um, uh, but but uh, yes, that is one of the markets. The company is not looking at that yet, but that would be a market for it. But I'll tell you, we can take uh, what we've done more recently which I think is, is really quite exciting, is that, is that we can, um, let me just think if we have this covered in a patent filing yet. Um, anyway, I'm, 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 not, I'm not sure that we do, but we can, we, can, we can make silicon carbide. We make silicon carbide, which is another abrasive. So the, the markets for these materials are going to be huge, and it's cheaper to make these than anything else because our source material, people pay us to take it. People pay, will pay us to take household waste. We will get paid to take PFAS. We'll, we are paid to take silicon, uh, 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 mixtures of silicon with carbon. Uh, they're very hard to dispose of. So it, it's, it's really interesting when you can take trash and turn it into cash in a flash. <laughs> um, it doesn't seem to be. So a lot of tests have been done with the inhalation of carbon nanotubes. Single wall nanotubes is not a problem because macrophages can wrap it up. The long, stiff, multi-wall nanotubes, those, those are like asbestos. Because when it gets into your lungs, your body tries to clear it out. And you have macrophages that gobble these things up, and they take it, and they bring it up, and you end up coughing it out. What happens with long nanotubes is they're longer than the macrophages themselves. So they're sticking out the ends. It's just what happens with asbestos, and, it, and, and so it's a dangerous material. People have studied graphene, and it seems to not be a problem. That's probably because it's so supple. These can be wrapped up, and then you end up coughing it out. So it seems to be a lot less trouble. But we take real care about this. And it depends on what your, if your source is metallurgical coke and you flash it, it's not a volatile, it's not a, it's not a very fluffy material that comes out. If you flash carbon black, like, like 20 nanometer carbon black, now you're left with a material that, that's a lot more puffy. You open up the container, it's just kind of floating in the air. So we take more precautions with that. But we, in our lab, we treat everything as dangerous. It's not like, oh, this is a nanomaterial. We got to be if you're an organic chemist, everything is dangerous. Mm -hmm. Everything. And, and, uh, and, that, and then that's just the way you treat it. Uh, and you wear safety glasses, you wear PPE, you only work in the hood. So for us, it's not a problem. Before it would ever get in industry, They'll test this a lot better, and they'll see what kind of precautions they have to take as they scale it up. But you, again, like you're already you're already consuming graphene all the time. It's in our it's a part of our environment. Are you were describing a Well, it, you know, it, it, it's sort of semi-batch because you have so many of these firing at once. But yeah, we have. I, I have 
I, I don't have a picture here, but it's, uh, it, it comes on a belt. It's coming on a belt, and this thing comes out, boom, flash, and lifts up. And so the belt is, is, is only stopped for a fraction of a second during the flash, and then it continues on. So that's, that's, that's almost a continuous process. It's just that it's interrupted you know, for 0.1 seconds. Is so, there, is there a three-dimensional limit that what you can Yeah, there is, and, it, and, it, and that depends on how much electricity you can bring in, what your voltage and what your current is your, is your source. That's all that limits you. There's, there's, no, there's no physical limit other than the limit of the amount of electricity you can bring in. Yeah. So when you say the laser-induced graphing, laser-induced graphing is where a laser comes down and writes on a surface. Flash graphing is where you put electrodes across something and flash it. Which one do you want me to talk about? The laser one. Okay, we have never done laser-induced graphing with PFAS. And you did the uh, flash? We did, we did the flash graphing with PFAS, and that's right. The on that one, we didn't catch the byproducts, it just goes out the hood. So what, I told you, what I told you last night when we were not in an open forum, is I told you the process by which we trap all of the fluorine, we're accounting for 97% of it. But I don't want to mention that here because it's an open forum and it's being recorded. You understand what I'm saying? Until, until I, I mean, you're a corporate guy, you understand that more than anyone. But we, we discussed this face to face last night at the table. Remember that? It was, it was, uh, yeah, that's, it, it was, it's like 18 hours ago. But it, 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 it appears that microbes cannot easily oxidize it. Now, I guarantee you, you could find, you could engineer microbes to oxidize this. There will be environments where you could, you could do this. But it's, it's slow to oxidize. And it's, it, it's an amazing thing. Just think about it. You don't have to slow it down forever. If you just slow this thing down for 100 years, that's it. You're done. Because in 100 years, we'll have other energy sources where we're not going to be we're not going to care about CO2 anymore. CO2 is not going to be our problem. We'll have other problems in 100 years. So you, only, you, don't, you don't have to slow this thing down eternally. You just got to slow things down 100 years. And it's, it's, uh, you know, it's your, 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 your grandchildren's problem, not my problem. Yeah. Graphene plus asphalt will solve your pothole problems. <laughs>